And joining us now to talk about healing the ozone layer, Derwood Zelke. He is president of the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, and he joins us on the line from the American Capitol in Washington, D.C. Mr. Zelke, how are you tonight? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for being, having me on the show. We are pleased to have you with us. It seems a, a long time, I think, since most of our viewers have thought about that ozone layer and what happened to it in the first place. So let's do a little background to start with, if we can. What caused the creation of the holes in the ozone layer that had people so exercised 20 and 30 years ago? Well, we had a series of chemicals, uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, chief among them, that we used as refrigerants in our air conditioning, in our refrigerators, uh, in our um, mobile air conditioning, and as agents for blowing foam. And these chemicals and related chemicals turned out to migrate to the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, and they would react with the sunlight and they would destroy ozone. And they would continue destroying ozone for literally hundreds of years. So it was a, a series of chemicals that, uh, that we manufactured. They didn't exist without uh, human invention. And they turned out to be good for one purpose and very bad for the ozone layer. And remind us why we need the ozone layer and why it would be a bad thing to have holes in it. Well, the ozone layer is a protective shield that screens out ultraviolet radiation, certain spectrum, the B spectrum in particular. If you don't screen that out, you get a series of dangerous effects. The first one would be uh, skin cancer millions of cases of skin cancer around the year. You get cataracts. Cataracts can be corrected in the developed world. We can go to the hospital if you have good health care in Canada, you can get it fixed there. But in the developing world, if you get cataracts, it can mean death because you can't go out and hunt, fish, or farm. You get suppression of the immune system. So we're already under stress from a challenging lifestyle, from different chemicals in the environment. If we get our immune su system suppressed further, we're in, uh, inviting uh, illness and death. We also uh, had serious impacts on agricultural productivity. So all in all, this was, a, this was very bad to lose that protective shield. And one more question on background here. The world, seeing this problem, came together in a unique fashion. Uh, there's a Canadian connection here, so remind us of how the world came together and what they resolved. Well, the scientists, starting in uh, the United States, uh, Sherry Rowland and uh, his then postdoc student, uh, Mario Molina, discovered that these CFCs were in fact going up to the stratosphere and destroying the ozone layer. And they published this uh, 1974. And the world started responding both with voluntary measures, then national measures, U.S., Canada, and Europe. Uh, we stopped using hairspray, underarm deodorant spray that was uh, propelled by these CFCs. That wasn't enough. It was a good start, but it wasn't enough. And so the world came together in 1987 and created an international treaty. Uh, it was done in Montreal, so it's called the Montreal Protocol on Substances uh, that uh, Deplete the Ozone Layer. And that treaty, it turns out, is the best environmental treaty the world has ever created, both because it has now phased out 96 dangerous chemicals by almost 100 percent, by 97 percent. And while it's done that, it's put the ozone layer on the path to recovery by later in the century, by uh, 2065 probably. And at the same time, because these dangerous chemicals also are climate warming chemicals, we've gotten a huge collateral benefit for climate mitigation. So the status of the ozone layer today is what? It's healing. Now when you, when you have a problem like this, your chemicals go up into the atmosphere, they stay there for a long time. So you stop putting them out, which we've now done pretty much, but the lag time is significant. So we say that we put it on the path to recovery, but it won't recover until about 2065, and then that'll be recovery to the pre-1980 level. We'll still have a, a further distance to go. And because the climate system interacts with the stratospheric ozone layer, 
as we cause global warming, we have to watch out that we're not exacerbating the existing uh, ozone problem as well. So we may have to do further work in the future. We just discovered, and a paper was published a couple of weeks ago by scientists who discovered that nitrous oxides were also uh, damaging the ozone layer. So this is not yet uh, under a control mechanism. So we're going to have to keep an eye on other things to make sure we finish the job of healing the ozone layer. Well, this story goes even further and takes a bit of a bizarre twist, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted you on the program tonight. CFCs, you're quite right, were seen as dangerous. They have been all but eliminated and replaced in many cases by hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. What do HFCs do to the atmosphere? And then we'll follow up with something on that as well. Well, we phased out the CFCs because we knew they were really bad. And then we went to transition chemicals. We knew they were better, but not perfect. Those were the HCFCs. And we're now accelerating the phase out of those explicitly because we know that they're bad for ozone and bad for climate. But as we've done that, and that was done in 2007, also in Montreal at the 20th anniversary of this treaty, but as we've accelerated the phase out of the transition chemicals, we've been moving into a new category called HFCs, the hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, now, these chemicals have no impact on the ozone layer, so we'd say, well, that's, that's good. But they have a very high impact on global warming. So now we're realizing, just as we're moving in that direction, that's not good. And so we're trying to make a further adjustment here to get out of the HFCs before we get into them. And if we don't do that, the HFCs are projected to grow to become a huge part of the climate problem. And they could be up to 45 percent uh, of the damage done from CO2, which is your dominant uh, climate gas, by 2050 if we don't nip them in the bud right now. Well, in fact, we've got a couple of graphs here that we want to share with you and our viewers to help illustrate mm -hmm. what you're just talking about right now, how HFCs contribute to climate change. Michael, let's bring that up if we can. As a planet, we are trying to reduce carbon emissions, and yet, as this graphic shows, a kilogram of one of the most common HFCs is equivalent to more than 1,400 kilograms of CO2 in terms of its climate-changing potential. Now, there's another one being used, an alternative to HFCs, long name, HFO, 1234YF, that can be used in things such as car air conditioners, and this replacement does not contribute, as the graphic indicates, to climate change much more than carbon dioxide. And my question is, we have this, you know, kind of crazy rule of unintended consequences here. You've phased out CFCs, you've got HFCs, which are better for the ozone layer, but are now causing global warming much more significantly. How close are we to seeing an alternative to these HFCs, such as the one we just showed in that graphic? Well, I think we're ready to move into the HFOs. They're a good, good substitute for many of the uses. Uh, as you say, they only have a global warming potential of four compared to CO2, which is one. That's, that's de minimis, uh, given the, the volume that we use here. So the, the HFOs would be very good. They're also natural refrigerants. The CO2 itself can be compressed and used as a refrigerant. And the history uh, of the way we've addressed these chemicals under the Montreal Protocol is that we say, these are bad chemicals. We, we do the studies, we determine that they're bad, and then we set a schedule for phasing out the production and consumption. This is upstream. There are only a few producers, uh, more consumers, but we're not talking about every individual uh, refrigerator and, and air conditioner. We go upstream and we phase out on a predetermined schedule. Uh, and this is what we would do with the HFCs. Every time we've done a phase out like this in the past, and as I mentioned, we've done 96 chemicals, the market looks at it and says, here's the schedule for losing this chemical, but here's also the schedule that opens up space for a new chemical, for the substitutes. So substitutes have always flowed into the market in time as we've phased out. And we do the phase outs over uh, two or three decades. So we have plenty of time. We've got the HFOs already. We've got some natural refrigerants. And we've got plenty of time to develop all of the alternatives we need 
so that we don't have to get into this dangerous HFC. Well, not to take too much issue with you, but I'm going to show another graphic now to you and our viewers, which um, I'm going to ask you to speak to because some would suggest we don't have that much time, and for this reason. Here is HFC usage in developing countries, and this graph shows how the use of HFCs are set to figuratively explode in the developing world. People, of course, buying cars with air conditioners, fridges, other goods that we take for granted, they are now, um, you know, th there's about to be an explosion of usage of HFCs in the developing world, things that we've taken for granted. How do we sort of get a, uh, a handle on this without penalizing those who simply want what we've had for so many years? This is a very good graphic, and thanks for bringing it up. It does show that if we don't address this problem, we're going to end up with about 10 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And this could swamp our efforts to cut the emissions of CO2. So it's absolutely critical that we do put the brakes on the production consumption of the HFCs. Uh, the way we do this is we, we agree under the Montreal Protocol. There's a proposal pending right now under the Montreal Protocol to do just this. We'd set a freeze date, say 2012, and then we'd have a phase-out schedule. The phase-out schedule that's been proposed by a group of island states because they fear the sea level rise that will come from climate change in the near term. They've set a uh, phase-out schedule of about five percent uh, per year and that would eliminate most of this. What happens once the Montreal Protocol seizes control of one of these chemicals, industry looks around and says, look, we can see the handwriting on the wall. The chemical is going to disappear from the universe. So even though we might have more time to use it uh, in the future, let's get out of it now. We know it's been stigmatized. Industry has moved ahead of the phase-outs uh, always in the past. The, the smart money is always to get out early and get into the new stuff fast. Well, let me give you an analogy, and you tell me if it works for this thing that we're talking about here. Everybody acknowledges coal-fired generating stations are terrible for the environment, and some jurisdictions are moving to get rid of them, while the Chinese are building one new coal-fired generating plant per week. Uh, do we have the same situation here, where maybe in the West we recognize we've got to get out of HFCs, but there may be just you know plenty of jurisdictions in China, India, other developing countries that you know, don't share our commitment to getting rid of this? Well, the, again, very good question. The way Montreal Protocol has addressed the differential responsibilities between the northern developed countries and the southern developing countries is to say, we acknowledge that in the north we have uh, been the, the, the actors who developed these chemicals, who seeded them throughout the universe, and who are responsible for getting rid of them uh, have more of a responsibility for getting rid of them. So we are willing to move first and to give you in the developing world a 10-year grace period. Uh, in addition, the developed countries under Montreal Protocol have said, we will also pay the full incremental cost to the developing countries for making the transition to the safer alternatives. So th these two factors, the 10-year grace period, and the full payment for incremental cost is a way of providing equity or fairness to the developing world. And in the past, all countries, including China, including India, have said, we'll go along with this program because it's fair, you're treating us fairly, and you're going to develop the substitutes in the first 10 years, you're going to perfect them, you're going to drive the cost down, and then you're going to pay the incremental cost for us. We consider that a good and fair deal. That seems a good and hopeful place to leave this discussion. Mr. Zelke, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you.